All right, Howard Burton, one of our members, will be introducing John Magnuson, also one of our esteemed members. And John is a senior principal at international engineering firm Magnuson Clementic Associates, whose talk is entitled, Our Generation's Turn to Build Big in Seattle. Howard, would you like to do the introduction, please? Thank you, President Paul. It's my pleasure to introduce our member, John Magnuson, as today's speaker. John's firm of Magnuson Clemensic Associates has provided structural engineering for projects all over the world. A few of John's projects in Seattle include Safeco Field, Century Link Field, Seattle Central Library, Ben Roya Hall, Washington State Convention Center, Key Arena, Experience Music Project, Seattle Federal Courthouse, and the new Husky Stadium. John has been recognized as Washington State's Engineer of the Year, distinguished member of the American Society of Civil Engineers. He's a fellow of the Institution of Structural Engineers in London and an honorary member of the National American Institute of Architects. He's also a Seattle native and a Husky graduate. So I'm pleased to introduce John Magnuson. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Uh, good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and visiting Rotarians and guests. Uh, let's have some fun today. Um, first of all, Seattle, it is truly a modern international city. Yet when you look at Seattle compared to other cities in the world, we are a baby. We're relatively young. Um, if you look at Seattle in 1869, um, and think that that was only 144 years ago, that it was still forested hills. This is right in the heart of downtown Seattle right there. So how did we get from here to here? Um, what I've done is I've picked out a few transformational projects. Some you might consider good, some maybe not. But each was a stepping stone for our city. Let's take a look at some of these projects, but before I do, I'd like to thank the Washington State Department of Transportation, Leonard Garfield and the crew at Mohai, uh, HistoryLink.org, VintageSeattle.org, SeattlePI.com, uh, the work of historian Walt Crowley and photographer Paul Dorpat. I've been doing a lot of research, <laughs> so they were all very invaluable into it. Um, let's begin in 1859. This is the first known photograph of Seattle. Uh, Sarah Yesler is on the porch there in what we now call Pioneer Square, looking straight ahead at what we now call the Alaskan Way Viaduct. Of course, it wasn't there then. Now, if you look closely, you can actually see a water flume, a wooden water flume that's coming down. That was the water system in 1859. It came from a spring on the hill and fed uh, the city. It, by 1880, if you were looking down 2nd Avenue towards the Soto area, that whole area of water there, that is Soto. Um, Beacon Hill is in the background over here. Four years later, right down 2nd Avenue in 1884, there was a horse-drawn streetcar installed. Transformational. Uh, four years after that, there was an electric traction streetcar that was installed. The streetcar era in Seattle was pretty amazing. If you look at um, 1896, the layout of streetcars, uh, the lines were built privately in order to sell real estate in the suburbs in developments like Madison Park and Ballard and Greenwood, you know, the suburban areas. Around 1920, the city bought all of these private lines uh, from the various uh, owners. And by 1933, there were 410 streetcars on 29 streetcar routes. However, the system was going broke. And so by April of 1941, all 230 miles of streetcar rails had been ripped up and melted down for steel for the war effort. If we look at uh, in 
1900, um, the water system, the Great Fire of 1889, clearly demonstrated that the private water systems were not quite accurate and up to the, to the job. So a month after the fire, the citizens of Seattle voted 1,875 to 51 to create their own water system. Sounds like a mandate. Seattle was receiving water from the Cedar River by 1901. In 1904, the Great Northern Tunnel was built under downtown Seattle to reduce traffic, train traffic, along the waterfront. Kind of sounds familiar. Uh, but this one was built with pickaxes, shovels, and wheelbarrows. The Great Northern Tunnel was the largest, though not the longest, uh, tunnel in the nation. Uh, most people have probably heard of the Denny Regrade. However, Seattle had over 60 regrades. The Denny Regrade actually consisted of two major operations, one in 1910 and another in about 1930. You look at, um, there was, it was a different time, and if you didn't want to sell your property so that they could regrade, they just came up and regraded around you. <clears throat> Talk about political will. Uh, it was a different time. Now, where did all the earth go from these 60 regrades? Well, it provided landfill for our waterfront, for Soto, and for Harbor Island. This is looking at from Beacon Hill towards the Pioneer Square area in 1882. Um, Seahawk Stadium is right about here where the water is. By, 19, or by 1890, you can start to see the land and the fill taking place. By 1915, it was pretty much filled in, and the Soto area was pretty much as we know it today. Now, going back to 1909, the Alaska-Yukon Pacific Exposition was transformational for our city. It provided the new home for the University of Washington. 1917, the Ballard Locks and the Lake Washington Ship Canal connected Lake Washington and Puget Sound, lowered the lake by nine feet. Uh, in the period of 1921 through 1953, we built Ross Dam, Diablo Dam, and Gorge Dam up on the Skagit River to provide electricity for our community. In 1931, we constructed the Aurora Bridge and Aurora Avenue, which was very controversial at the time because it bisected Woodland Park. As we know now, Upper Woodland and Lower Woodland. In 1940, we uh, built the first floating bridge, the Mercer Island Bridge. By 1958, transformational project, Metro. Our first meeting of the Metro Board was in 1958. 1962, the World's Fair. Um, in fact, if you look at this carefully, you can see I-5 in the background there is still under construction. Um, transformational as a city on the world stage. In the early 1960s, we put I-5 right through the heart of downtown Seattle. Um, like I said, all of these developments, you may judge them as good or bad, but they formed the basis of our city. In 1983, uh, we got the new West Seattle Bridge, and in 1989, the Mount Baker Ridge I-90 tunnel set world records. Now, these are all things that we did. It's often enlightening to look at some of the projects that never made it off the drawing board. Um, some of these may be good and some bad. I have my opinions. I'll see what you think. The R.H. Thompson Expressway. You know the bridges to nowhere over in the Arboretum? Well, this is where the bridges were supposed to go. This is Husky Stadium. This is Laurelhurst. This was going to be the R.H. Thompson Expressway. The Bay Freeway, which I always thought just went from I-5 to the Seattle Center. I never could quite figure out why it was called the Bay Freeway. Well, it's because it turned down and went to Elliott Bay where it would connect with the Alaskan Parkway and the Alaskan Freeway along our waterfront. We argued for 10 years about this little green line right here, the Alaskan Way Viaduct. Think if we had built this. Um, the other thing was, anybody know what that is? That's the Pike Place Market, or what it was potentially going to be before we put a stop to it. Uh, one of the my personal opinion, one of the biggest mistakes we made, this is the 1968 heavy rail transit proposal for forward thrust that we turned down. It did get built in Atlanta. <laughs> 
So as we look back um, at the realized and unrealized projects, there were hits and misses, good and bad. Um, it's now our generation's turn to add infrastructure to our city. Uh, we're going to be building a lot. Uh, there's a green flyer on your, your tables that talks about the $16 billion in public projects that are in the pipeline right now. Um, I'm going to focus on just two of these projects, the two largest ones. Both are world record-setting projects, the new SR520 floating bridge and the Alaskan Way viaduct replacement. Now, I haven't personally worked on either of these, um, but two people who are working on them are here to join me later to answer your questions. Uh, Julie Meredith, if you can raise your hand, she's the SR520 program director, and Matt Preeti, he's one of the directors on the SR99 Alaskan Way Viaduct project. So let's start with this bridge. The original bridge opened in 1963. Why a floating bridge? Well, the water is 214 feet deep out in the middle. Any other kind of bridge just didn't make sense. It was really a breakthrough to be able to use a floating bridge. Now, br the bridge has served the region well for 50 years, but it is vulnerable to severe windstorms and earthquakes. It needs to be replaced. Just the weight of the strengthening that's been done over the years to try to make it stronger, has that extra weight has caused the bridge to sink a, a foot further down in the water than when it was first built. Now, the original bridge um, is the uh, longest floating bridge in the world, the existing bridge. Uh, the roadway is directly on top of the pontoons, and uh, the pontoons are 60 feet wide. The new bridge will increase to 116 feet from 60. Uh, there'll be a 14-foot bike and pedestrian path on the one side, uh, four general purpose lanes, two transit lanes, two shoulders. The pontoon height of the old bridge the depth of the pontoon was 15 feet. The new bridge will be almost twice that at 28 feet. With the new deck 10 feet above the pontoons, right in here, it's raised above the pontoons, crews can do maintenance without interrupting traffic. Uh, the roadway is 20 feet on the new bridge is 20 feet above the water instead of 13 feet above the water on the existing bridge. So those pictures of the storm, the waves coming over, that extra uh, seven feet of height should help that a lot. Now, the new bridge will be directly north of the existing bridge. If you take a look from the west looking east at the new bridge, um, the floating portion will actually be about 130 feet longer than the bridge it's replacing. The uh, transition spans will be much more graceful than the current steel trusses. Um, it's really going to be a very uh, beautiful bridge. Now, the way the bridge floats is on three different types of pontoons. Um, a cross pontoon, there's just one of those at each end of the bridge. There's longitudinal pontoons, which are the main pontoons that go along the axis of the bridge. And then a new thing are supplementary pontoons that are bolted on like outriggers to help stabilize that bridge. So when you look at these pontoons, this, this uh, longitudinal pontoon, 360 feet long, 75 feet wide, 28 feet tall. I have no idea why it floats. But, oh wait, no, I do, I, I do know. <laughs> um, if they were solid, if they were solid concrete, 150 pounds a cubic foot, they would sink immediately to the bottom. Uh, but these are actually, they actually have air cells. Um, so the density is about one-fifth of that. The density of this pontoon right here is about 30 pounds a cubic foot. It's 80% air. Um, a watermelon, has a density of 60 pounds per cubic foot. A potato has a density of 48 pounds a cubic foot. A marshmallow has a density, if you had a marshmallow that was a foot, uh, would be 23 pounds per cubic foot. So this bridge is somewhere between potato and marshmallow. Uh, I'm not sure you would want to use either of the alternate materials, but this seemed like a good choice. Now, to build one of these pontoons, you go to IKEA and you get this assembly chart. <laughs> Pull it all together, and you have a pontoon. Now, really, seriously, um, it's quite an operation, very technical. Uh, there's all the cells. This is one of the pon or two of the pontoons, or one of the pontoons, before the lid has been cast on top of it. Now, a lot of the pontoon construction is being done in Aberdeen, and 
Of course, if you're building at Aberdeen, you need to get it to the site, so the pontoons go on a journey around the Olympic Peninsula, and when they get to the Ballard Locks, they just barely squeeze through. That was part of the planning. Um, when you um, look at some of the other sites, there's uh, uh, work being done in Kenmore and in um, Tacoma. So the bridge is being built in lots of different locations, all floated in to uh, be erected. When the pontoons arrive at the site, they're bolted together. So here's one of the big longitudinal pontoons. This is one of the end cross pontoons, and then the supplementary side pontoons. Here's another longitudinal pontoon going. So they, the longitudinal ones line up end to end. Those are bolted together with 80 three and a half inch steel bolts at every one of those joints. Uh, that's really strong. Um, here's actually the first assembly. You can see a longitudinal pontoon and some supplementary pontoons. Now, okay, we've got it floating, but we want to have it stay where it's supposed to be. So there are um, 58 anchor cables coming off of, splaying out of the sides of the bridge, and um, there's different types of anchors. Um, the most common type that we use is called a fluke anchor, and it's basically a 35 foot by 26 foot concrete wall with a steel bracket on it. Now that particular um, fluke anchor is sunk into the lake and jetted down into the lake bottom. Then a bunch of rock, that's an engineering term, a bunch of rock <laughs> is placed on that and this thing is really heavy and will not move. Um, here's one of the fluke anchors as it's being installed down in the lake. 30 of the 45 fluke anchors that will be needed to keep the bridge in place are already installed, already on the lake bottom. Another interesting thing, uh, at the anchor end of the cable in the bridge, um, where it terminates in the bridge, uh, they will terminate in hydraulically controlled jacks that can adjust the tension in the cable based on bridge movement. This is a really uh, unique thing. Now, um, the new bridge will have sensors, uh, moisture sensors, so that you can have rapid response if there's any water getting into any of the pontoons, and even um, areas of electrified rebar with DC current to protect against corrosion. Um, how will a bridge actually tie in? The, at the um, west end, the new bridge is coming across here. This is the existing bridge. There'll be a, a link connection to tie the new bridge to the existing bridge. Once that transition link is in, then the original bridge will uh, be removed. From a funding standpoint, uh, the main part of the bridge is under construction. It's funded. The north half of the approach bridge is funded. The south half is not, as is the rest of the way to I-5. It's only partially funded. Uh, just a little sneak peek. Now, this isn't finalized yet, but um, from I-5 over to the lake, there'll be a lid at the I-5 end and a lid in the Mount Lake neighborhood. Now, the bridge cost is published as $4.1 billion. Um, that's actually the entire 520 project, which includes more than just the bridge. The pontoon contract was 367 million, and the floating bridge construction contract was 586 million. So there's a lot of other money going to things other than the bridge itself. Um, per the contract, the bridge will be open in 2015, and um, there'll be six lanes of traffic by the end of 2016. So, that's the floating bridge project. Um, if we move from a project on the water to a project underground, uh, moving over to the, um, the viaduct replacement. Now, an underground project, the story actually starts in the air with a viaduct. Uh, the original viaduct was built in phases from 1949 to 1954. It was an engineering marvel. Um, the viaduct has actually provided decades of use, but began to show its age. The 2001 Nisqually earthquake accelerated its aging process. It was clear that it, it had reached the end of its useful life. After a decade or more of political fighting, it was decided to construct a deep bore tunnel underneath the city. Now, this tunnel will be 1.7 miles long, and the top of it will be as deep as 200 feet 
below the street. The tunnel will be the world's largest diameter at 56 feet. There'll be two lanes of traffic, one eight-foot shoulder, one two-foot shoulder in each direction. The tunnel exterior, the basic tunnel shell itself, is made of rings of two-foot thick solid concrete. Um, these rings, which are two-foot thick, are six and a half feet wide along the end of the tunnel. So these will all stack end to end uh, to form the tunnel enclosure itself. Uh, the tunnel will go under buildings and their foundations, uh, um, utility lines, streets. It has to go under two other tunnels, the Burlington Northern Railroad Tunnel from 1904 and the Battery Street Tunnel. So how will you get into this tunnel? At the south end, um, that's the southbound and northbound lanes of uh, SR99 converge on each other and then go into the tunnel. There's also going to be ramps to go directly uh, to and from the Alaskan Way, um, uh, Alaskan Way, I was almost said the viaduct, <laughs> uh, from Alaskan Way. At the north end of the tunnel, this is uh, the current Aurora Avenue alignment right here. This is Mercer Street. This is the third phase of the Gates Foundation, which isn't built yet, but the tunnel entrance will be right here at about 6th and Harrison. So how do you dig a tunnel under the city with all these buildings and utilities and all these things going on? Well, the answer is an $80 million piece of equipment called a tunnel boring machine. It has an outside diameter of 57 and a half feet and it is the largest in the world. It's 326 feet long. That's about the length of some of our biggest ferry boats. Um, the front end right up here is a rotating cutter head kind of like a cheese grater that will push against the soil and, is that a good term? <laughs> um, push against the soil, the unexcavated soil. Conveyor belts then will carry that soil out of the back through the uh, uh, end of the tunnel boring machine and all the way out of the tunnel. Now also in this, this trailing gear right here be, behind the cutter head is um, the path for incoming pieces of concrete tunnel segment. Uh, there's supplies like grout and grease. There's restrooms. There's a kitchen. There will be about 25 crew members inside this machine at any given time. Now looking a little bit more closely at this is a similar machine. This is the cutter head right up here. This is the mixing chamber where all the soil that goes through the cutter head collects. And then this is a shield that protects the machinery and the workers until these concrete tunnel segments can be put in place. Now this is an auger that takes the soil and lifts it from the mixing chamber and puts it on the conveyor belt. Um, the cutter head rotates and there's 700 soil cutting tools on its face. It's powered by 25,000 horsepower. Uh, jacks push against the previously placed concrete rings to put the pressure on the cutting head to cut the soil. The machine will average about 35 feet of tunnel a day and as the cutter head rotates the mixing chamber in here, you can see it's full of soil and then the auger is lifting the soil and putting it onto the conveyor. Now the soil will come out the, the south end of the tunnel, go on conveyors over to barges uncontaminated soil, will, there's a disposal site near Port Ludlow, contaminated soil will be sent off by rail or truck to a special disposal facility. Um, all told there will be 850,000 cubic yards of earth taken out for this tunnel. If you piled that up on the turf at Seahawk Stadium, it would be more than 400 feet tall, about 100 feet taller than the roof of the stadium. So we're not going to have that in the stadium, that's not. Um, the concrete uh, segments will be uh, placed using a special device within the tunnel boring machine that can lift up a panel, a concrete segment, and then rotate it around and put it into place so that it, the machine actually places all the concrete. Now these segments are then um, sealed with gaskets and um, doweled and bolted together so they become like one rigid unit. 
Um, a ring is complete when the final key piece, the key segment, is in place. Then the tunnel machine can go forward again. Now, this ring is big. This tunnel is big. This is a mock-up of the actual pieces uh, of the tunnel segment for this tunnel in France. The tunnel boring machine right now uh, is getting ready, or has left uh, Japan, getting ready to leave Japan. Um, its name is Bertha. Um, and at first I thought, that's not really, that's kind of like a sexist name or something. But actually, it's exactly the opposite. It was named in honor of Bertha Knight Landis uh, in a naming contest. She was, Bertha was elected mayor of Seattle in 1926 and was the first woman to lead a major American city. I think it's very good that Bertha is going to lead our progress through this tunnel. Um, the cutter head. You see the scale of this thing. Then here it is being attached to the front of the tunnel boring machine. Um, it will rotate enough as it's drilling this tunnel to, if, it, if you were rotating and counted the revolutions and then let it roll across the country, it would go 2,300 miles. That's like rolling to New York City. Uh, the tunnel boring machine will be broken down into 41 separate pieces and shipped to Pier 46. And then um, it'll arrive sometime this spring. The pieces will be transported to the launch pit, which is over here. It'll be reassembled in the pit. The pit looks, it's going to be 80 feet deep, 80 feet wide, and 400 feet long. So this big machine will be reassembled there so it can be launched and start drilling under the city. Um, the launch pit is in the south end. The tunnel goes from south to north, and the TBM will emerge at the north end. So there's um, 14,000 concrete segments needed, the individual little pieces, to form all these rings. They'll be cast off site and stored right here. Uh, this is a sample of, a, of segment storage, lots of concrete pieces. And then the segments are transported into the launch pit and then sent into the tunnel for placement by the tunnel boring machine. Now, the TBM will start in the middle of this year, actually doing the drilling, and you won't see it again until a little over a year when it emerges in the North Portal. Uh, there have been over 600 borings to investigate subsurface soil conditions. There are eight different types of soil along the route. Um, to make sure everything is going according to plan, there will be an extensive building and surface monitoring system. Uh, there will be about 160 buildings above the tunnel alignment itself that they've been examined and there's about 200 of them that will be fitted with monitoring equipment. There will be nearly 700 devices monitoring streets and sidewalks. Nearly a half a dozen uh, different kinds of monitors will give real-time feedback. Some of the particularly sensitive buildings along the right-of-way have already had some stabilizing work done to minimize the chance of settlement. So, to add to the complication of building this tunnel, uh, the work will be going on um, on several other projects all around at the same time. The South Atlantic Street overpass, the Elliott Bay Seawall, the Waterfront Seattle project, um, the New Alaskan Way, the Elliott and Western Avenue uh, connections, and the Mercer Corridor. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> this right here will become this. When you look at the, the tunnel, it's a three point, the project's a $3.1 billion project. The tunnel is scheduled to open in December of 2015. The Waterfront Seattle project, which is actually, I believe, a city of Seattle project, is scheduled to open in December of 2019. And now, moving on to a few previews of coming attractions, some of the things that hopefully our generation will continue to be doing. Um, you're all familiar with Sound Transit. Uh, we have a, there'll be a lot of sound transit uh, uh, construction coming. Uh, this was one of our transformational projects for our generation. Um, there's another project. Um, there might be a new arena. It might be on this site. It might look like this. <laughs> Only time will tell. Well, I look forward to what our generation will build. I hope that we are making the right decisions about what we're building and the right decisions for our children and their children and their children. Thank you.
Matt, Matt and Julie, uh, the engineers, uh, we, I'd take some questions. Since they're the ones who really know about it, uh, why don't you come up and join me? And we've got about five minutes for questions. Yes. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. Quite informative. Uh, 15, 20 seconds about uh, why we didn't just make a big cut down the waterfront, overcover it, and do the seawall at the same time we create a freeway. No tunnel boring. We just would have done a big ditch for oh, our. Oh, you mean the, like the original tunnel proposal? Yeah. The why we didn't, cover why, why we didn't do that one? The combined seawall tunnel. Yeah. The original yeah. one. Twenty seconds. So there's two reasons that we didn't do that. First, we studied that option back in 2006, 2007. There was a public advisory vote in 2007 on a cut and cover option along the waterfront. The public said no to that. And as we know, as we know in this town, it's hard to get anything done unless you have the majority of the public be behind you. Uh, two, um, or, or unless you have a really big fire, or a really big fire. Yeah, <laughs> um, in order to in, in order to uh, build the cut and cover on the waterfront, um, we would have had to have shut the SR99 corridor down for a period of several years, and clearly that's a very uh, important cor corridor to maintain mobility and economic vitality in the a the area. And so it was not on the top of a, of, of our uh, list. Thanks. I would like to know about the article that was in the paper this morning about the override. And I'd like to know where are we going to go instead of the, I, the viaduct without paying a toll? Well, let me do, let me just which, yeah, which article are uh, the bridge? This is like a surprise question. <laughs> are you talking about the floating bridge? The bridge. I think the question is what happens on the 520 program. I think a lot of what was focused on here today was about the floating bridge and construction underway. The section that he showed with uh, dashed portions in the city of Seattle is a section that isn't funded for construction. We had a legislative work group, uh, I think that was in 2009, and that legislative work group made up of uh, legislators from the west side of the lake and the east side of the lake, Secretary of Transportation and the transportation chairs came up with a finance plan. And the finance plan for 520 for the remaining sections that aren't funded for construction said look for, few, for federal dollars, which we've continued to do through, uh, many of you know about the Tiger funding, we've applied for that. We were successful in getting a, a loan from the USDOT with a great interest rate and we called that the, the TIFI loan and that allowed us to further construction another 300 million but the gap is really 1.4 billion and the legislature said if you can't get other state or federal funding to fill that gap then we would look to tolling I-90 as part of the solution for financing for 520 and that is part of the discussion going on now if they toll I-90 what are the ramifications and what are the impacts of that and the department was funded to do an environmental uh, review of that work, and that work is underway right now. So I, I did. Should I answer the yep. morning's paper? I just. Oh, I just go ahead. You might as well answer it before they ask. Before they ask it, yeah. <laughs> so uh, many of you may have seen the news yesterday and today, and the Secretary of Transportation, Paula Hammond, um, came out and said that the design of the floating bridge, which was done by the Washington State DOT's Bridge and Structures Office, had a design flaw. And four of the pontoons that we've constructed, three of the longitudinal pontoons and a cross pontoon on the lake, will need to be retrofit with some post tensioning. We have post tension in the structure, just not in the transverse or short direction. So we'll be doing that. And we're in the middle of negotiating change orders with our contractor on that issue. One more question. When the new tunnel is completed, what happens to the old Battery Street tunnel? So we thought maybe we could turn it into the world's largest pink elephant car wash. <laughs> um, but realistically, uh, the, ba the Battery Street Tunnel is in just as bad a shape as the viaduct itself. It is uh, structurally unsound. If we were to keep that open for some sort of public facility or even private facility, it would cost over $200 million to retrofit it. The city has no use for it. The state has no use for it. So since nobody can uh, figure, figure out what they want it for, 
and it would cost a lot of money to keep it operational. Uh, our plan is to decommission it. And currently my plan is to, um, when we demolish the viaduct along the central waterfront, we take that concrete, we crush it up, and we use that to fill in the ba ba Battery Street. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Always interesting to see some people. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.